How are you, sir? Can you hear me? Yep, can hear you loud and clear. <clears throat> All right. So you're in charge. So, you want to let people in. Yeah, we've got people joining in now. So let's just give them a minute here as the numbers are going up. Great. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll get started in just two minutes here while everybody else joins up. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for coming. Today we're gonna to be talking about the big bad, the FTC and their ban on non-competes. And primarily what that means for many of you all as entrepreneurs, as employees, contractors and other workers, and some of the basics that everyone should should get familiar with whether it's yourself your friends your family and otherwise and this is of course relevant because there has been a new change in the law coming all the way down from the federal government the federal trade commission so this is kind of breaking news we're in uh, an interesting period because uh, the law will go into effect if nothing else changes in early september so we are recording this on june 18th and by the way, there is a recording, so this will be available. And if anyone wants to rewatch it or share it with anyone they know, we'll make that easy. And um, Ben, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, Benjamin Bedrava. I am one of our senior corporate attorneys at EPGD Business Law. Uh, one of my focuses and practice areas is in mergers and acquisitions, which, as you can imagine, involves a lot of people. And whenever there are people, there are contracts. And in this case, that means everything from owners coming in and going and whether they have non-competes in those situations, employees who are trying to be retained, employees who are leaving and, and the like. And then with me today, we have Eric Rodebois, the managing partner of the firm. Eric? Uh, hi everyone, Eric Rodebois. Uh, I think my title is founding partner. And I'm glad you guys are all here. So EPGD is a full service business law firm. A lot of our clients are the business businesses and the business owners that are writing these agreements. And so for many, many years, I've been telling people, Florida is a pro business, pro employer and pro contract, pro non-compete state. And so there are a lot of uh, attorneys who specialize in, in basically doing nothing but non-compete litigation. And now this, this, is really like a landmark change in the law, which we're gonna get into, that is gonna basically say that most non-competes aren't gonna be valid anymore. So I'm really excited about this presentation and I'm happy to be doing this with you, Ben. Absolutely, well, let's dive in and get started with just some of the groundwork. So, you know, first and foremost, what is a non-compete? Oftentimes when we encounter a non-compete, we encounter them in the context of an employment agreement, a partnership agreement, or even a side agreement. You often see it a 
non-compete, non-solicit, non-disclosure, all rolled into one. But it's important to understand that the non-compete is that part of the restrictive covenants that stops a worker from engaging in a particular type of business that's going to be competitive with the other contracting party. So that does not mean that non-competes include non-disclosures. Non-competes don't include non-solicits or other restrictive covenants that you often see together. And so we want to be very focused on what it is that, that we're dealing it with and what it is that the FTC has been issuing a rule on, because that'll really affect what you guys want to focus on going forward. So typically, you'll use that non-compete to prevent a employee from going out and providing competitive goods or services to your same kind of customers once they leave their employment. You know, I will just say that there are other circumstances where non-competes are relevant. That often you mentioned mergers and acquisitions. So for example, if someone buys a business, you might say to the person selling the business, hey, you can't go and open a competing business around the corner for a certain period of time. And so we'll, we'll add non-compete language to um, purchase and sale agreements. A lot of times that's one of the items that's going to be negotiated. And another point that I want to make is that up until now, this was a very state-specific type of issue. So I actually have a handbook that I, that I found a few years ago that has every single state and their spe specific non-compete laws and language and enforceability. And so, for example, it's been pretty well known for a long time that non-competes in California are really not enforceable. And you can have one in a contract and the judges just won't enforce it. They'll just say, no, I don't agree with this. It's against public policy. And I actually had a case here in Florida once where a judge, which by the way, Florida, like I mentioned, is a very pro non-compete state. I had a judge who said, you know what? In my heart of hearts, I just don't like these things. I'm going to rule against it. You can appeal. And that he literally said it like that. And the funny thing is we went out in the hallway and settled the case. Um, so there was no appeal. But this is a very state-specific issue until now where the federal government has come in and said, all of you, uh, here's the new rules. Exactly. And, you know, being that we're located in Florida and many of our clients are also in Florida, it's going to be a big change. But because we have some of these states out there like California where non-competes haven't been enforceable for some time, there's a lot to draw on for how employers and other businesses have handled these situations without the benefit of the non-compete. So we'll kind of dive into that next. I mean, for now, let's talk about what, what are the key things that you usually see in a non-compete. Now, non-competes, they're still around. They're not going away completely, but they are going to be drastically cut back. The main things that you're going to typically see in a non-compete are going to be the duration. How long is this non-compete going to prevent you from engaging in that activity after whatever period ends? Usually employment in the context of a merger acquisition, the time of your ownership of the company terminating. So usually we have seen six months to two years being that reasonable time frame. Six months, I mean, especially in Florida, almost always being considered reasonable. Two years, then it started to get to the point of, okay, now it's really got to be, you know, a higher level employee, a higher level person that, you know, merits this longer period of time. Then we've got geographic area. So a non-compete. We're not always talking about you can't compete anywhere in the world. Most businesses are not located globally. Heck, most aren't even throughout the entire country. Many businesses are concerned with the 30-minute drive around where they're physically located that their consumer pool comes from, where the people that they would expect to come and work with them are going to be located. And then the scope what activities are actually being prohibited. So again, we talked about non-competes are where you can't engage in some sort of competitive behavior, but employers and companies often need to define what behaviors will be competitive. Say you have an LLC that you form with a partner. 
and you guys are going to be doing a wide variety of things. Well, most LLCs are not single purpose entities where they are formed for the sole purpose of performing one task, doing one type of business. They theoretically could engage in a wide variety of businesses. Whether you should do all that through one company is another story, but you've got to define what are the industries that the non-compete would actually apply to. And that's been, I think, the pitfall of most non-competes in terms of enforcement in the past. So these three things, each one can obviously be sculpted and, and put varying ways. So for example, I've seen up to five years be enforceable for the duration. And geographic area, you can do as the crow flies, 15 miles, five miles, 20 miles, or you could do by counties, so we see a lot of uh, the Miami-Dade County, or if you're going to be really broad, you could block off all of South Florida or Southeast Florida and say the Tri-County area. Um, and, or I've even seen within 20 miles of any location of the business, right? So let's say that it's a chain of restaurants and they have locations all over the place. And so it could be limiting the person in all in many areas around the country I've seen nationwide that that is harder to enforce, but the idea being maybe it's an online business, right? Maybe we only provide services online. And so we have clients literally everywhere. And right, maybe the, airline. the scope of activity, th this is so important. I actually, I have a, a sad story where I'm reviewing a non-compete after the violation, right? So this is when the, the client comes to me and says, oh no, my key employee, I found out that they set up a competing business and they're diverting clients. And I said, okay, did you make them sign something? And they said, yes. And I said, okay, send it over. And sure enough, they had the wrong industry as the prohibited scope of activity. So they were in recruiting and the industry was IT services, right? And so the guy was like, yeah, sure, I'll sign that, <laughs> you know, because he's, he's not in IT services. They, they literally didn't proofread their own contract. Um, or whoever drafted it for them used an old template and didn't update it. So if that was the case, they have a great mal malpractice lawsuit against the lawyer who drafted it. Well, thankfully that was not us, but it just goes to show how important it is to really pay attention when you're putting together an agreement and before you go to sign it, because that's the, the hard truth is that a lot of people will sign agreements that they just didn't even know what it said. And with this new ruling, even if you don't realize that there's a non-compete in your contract, it might have been enforceable unless now it's being invalidated by this new rule. Which leads to the next slide, which is why do we even need non-competes? Exactly. I mean, the point of a non-compete was to protect an employer or a business's legitimate interests. So what are those? Oftentimes that's going to be your trade secrets and confidential information. That could be customer lists, proprietary information, strategies, forecasts, plans, uh, could be preserving your customer relationships. Now your employees are often going to be the person at the forefront of your business. If you have say sales reps or you have service providers those may be the person that your customer is interacting with directly. They're probably not going to the guys who own the company, to the managers of the business for every single transaction. They're working directly with your, your guys on the ground, and those are the people they're building a relationship with. Then you've got your investment in that employee. Most of the time, you're not going to hire someone and they're going to be ready at the drop of a hat to do everything exactly as you and your business want and need it. it takes time, it takes training, it takes investment. You might bring on someone knowing that for the first few months of their employment, they're going to be a, a loss, a cost center for your business. It's not going to be until some point where they hit that, that point on the learning curve and the scales tip to being profitable. And then of course, employers want to reduce turnover. Having that continuity in a business, having employees who are committed to staying, who have some form of loyalty to the, to the business is incredibly beneficial. Now, of course, that also comes at a cost. 
and the cost on the other side was typically to the employees. It reduces employee turnover, largely out of you know some level of fear or anxiety about the fact that they might not be able to leave if if they wanted to go and stay in their same field, stay in their profession, not uproot their families and move to another city. So um, I, I think a lot about these, I think the two most important things, and I'm speaking from a business owner perspective, is the secret sauce and the client list, right? So the secret sauce is the what is the special ways that we do things that you're going to learn because I'm going to teach you because you're working here and now I don't want you to go and go to my competition and teach them my secret sauce. Um, and then the second one is, of course, my client database, which is for most companies, one of their most important assets, right? Like the, the, the assets of my law firm are not the computers and the desks. You know, those are relatively inexpensive and replaceable, but the client list and those relationships and the goodwill and an interesting side note, uh, just for if anyone's curious, lawyers are not allowed to sign non-competes. And it's not actually to protect the, the law firms or the, in fact, even to protect the attorneys themselves. It's to protect the public's right to access as many good lawyers as they can have. Now, I just raised the issue. I could make the same argument for doctors, right? Why are doctors allowed to sign non-competes, but lawyers aren't? And so any lawyer can leave any law firm and start their own firm. And there's really nothing we can do with some limitations and, and some restrictions put in place by the bar. But doctors all the time, and, and I've even seen it where they'll leave a big medical group and the big medical group will have a very broad non-compete and they'll have to go do something else for two years. Maybe they write a book or they go on sabbatical or they start a consulting business before they're allowed to go back into the medical profession. I guess that is the benefit of being the guys that that right argue and if you get high enough interpret the law we get to decide that we're we're exempt <laughs> now what's the effect of a non-compete so you know on one hand we have the positives we have that it hopefully protects your business from unfair competition it encourages your businesses to invest in their employees, invest in training, because they know those people are going to stay around. They know that those investments aren't going to just go and benefit some other business. But on the flip side, it does. It restricts employee mobility and career advancement. Sometimes employees see this as a way that they can't move up. They can't move on. They get to that feeling of feeling trapped and those resentments will build up. It can hinder innovation and market competition. Now, I mean, one of the biggest things that I think the FTC was looking at here were those two points were, you know, the ability of people to go out and find gainful employment and also the positive effect that competition can have in the marketplace. If you've locked up all of the valuable talent in the area, let's say you're a big medical group and you hire all the most skilled doctors in South Florida and none of them can go out and start another practice or work for someone else, then you've essentially created a monopoly on this type of practice in South Florida. It's a great idea. If I had the funds, that might be my next move. But uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that that we're now looking at as to what led us to this point. So you mentioned the monopoly. That's the argument for why they don't want lawyers to sign non-competes. Because you could imagine a scenario where one law firm hires every lawyer in town, makes them all sign a five-year non-compete, and then fires them all. And then they have the monopoly on legal services. Um, so obviously, that's an extreme example. But what, what I think a big takeaway is that this was overused. And so I did a bunch of cases where barbers, literally people who cut hair, were being were signing non-competes. And these people are typically not sophisticated. They're not highly educated. And a lot of them were actually immigrants. And this was maybe the best job they could get. And they were signing these non-competes, oftentimes without the advice of legal counsel, because it's a complete legal fiction that you're going to take a low paid person and say, hey, here's the sophisticated contract. Why don't you go hire a lawyer and and have them explain what it says? I, I, that's a legal fiction. They're not doing that. They're not going to hire a lawyer to review it. And then what they end up doing is they sign it because they need the job, because they got to feed their family, because their kid is sick. And then three years later, they're getting sued because they switch barbershops. 
Um, we were seeing at restaurants on South Beach, they were making the waiters sign non-competes. Now I can imagine the executive chef or the front of the house manager. Sure, I could I could make an argument for why they should be able, uh, the employer should be able to make the executive chef sign a non-compete, but the bus boy. Um, and so I think it was being overused and well, let's get serious. They got greedy and they pressed their luck and now they're gonna reap what they sow. Right, and like we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of overlap between non-competes and other restrictive covenants. And especially for those lower level employees, even carving out the non-competes, and we'll get to this and some of the alternatives a little bit later, there are a lot of different ways that an employer can protect the things that they're truly interested in. If they think about not just non-compete, think about what are those things that I actually care about or that will actually affect my business if this happens, if this employee leaves and does X, Y, Z. Like I said, the client list and the secret sauce. Exactly. Now, enforcement of non-competes, we talked about this a little bit, very different state to state. So California especially has had pretty broad bans, except in the most narrow circumstances, whereas Florida was very heavily employer favoring in favor of enforcing non-competes, allowing parties to contract with each other however they saw fit and trusting that the parties truly had, you know, some understanding or, or say so when they're negotiating those agreements, whether that's true or a fiction or not. But, um, you know, each state really had a lot of different rules. And so for some like Florida, this is going to be a, a much bigger shift. Right. And, and so in California, they, they're saying, come on, the employees don't have equal bargaining power. They don't have the right to go hire. I mean, they, they don't have the power or the money to go hire lawyers. We're, we don't believe you. Whereas in Florida, they're like, everyone has the right to go hire lawyers and negotiate contracts. And so here we go. Let's, let's see what the FTC uh, is going to tell us. So April 23rd was the big day. The final rule came out banning post-employment non-competes for individuals who provide work or services to a business or another person. So what does that really mean? You know, a few things we wanna focus on. This is only for post-employment restrictions and it's only for the actual natural person, the individual. We're not talking about during your employment. We're not talking about business to business. So in that context, during employment, those non-competes could still be around. If we're talking about another company, those things are going to be unaffected. So the rule is going to both ban new non-competes and to some extent retroactively invalidate those existing non-competes as of the effective date. So right now, the rule is slated to go into effect September 4th. It underwent or it's undergoing a 120 day publication period in the Federal Register. And at the close of that September 4th, that's when all of these things are going to take effect. That's when non-competes would effectively no longer be enforceable and new non-competes could not be entered into. The big rationale by the FTC was that under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, non-competes were a form of unfair competition. And that is really what they built into the rule was that as a definition, these things are considered objectively unfair competition unless, and then provided a handful of exceptions. The idea here being, again, we promote competition. We have free and fair economy, uh, freedom of workers to, to change jobs, have that mobility. Now, I personally think they went too far. Um, I thought that the way to split the baby proverbially would be to allow non-competes for highly trained or high, and highly paid workers and eliminate non-competes for lower trained and lower paid workers. I thought that was going to be the fair compromise because I can still see a valid reason in certain circumstances to have post-employment non-competition uh, agreements. However, and let's reiterate a point, 
during employment, we can still have non-compete agreements, right? So that that will still be a part of, of regular employment agreements that while you're working and, and devoting your best energies that you can't compete. Um, and then I will say one other thing, there used to be a distinction between non-competes for W-2 employee people and 1099 independent contractor people. Now, Florida is one of the very few states that actually explicitly allows non-competes for 1099 and independent contractor people, um, which I think a little bit boggles the mind, right? Because I'm supposed to be independent. I can do anything I want. But if I work for you and sign this agreement, I can't work for anybody else, even though I'm independent, um, which most other states said that makes no sense. Florida said it was fine. But this rule applies to everybody. This rule applies to, with the exception of company to company, like Ben said. Exactly. And let's talk about who this does apply to. So it is your employees. So your actual W-2 employees that are, are hired and working for your company, whether these are entry level or high up positions, although there is a carve out for senior executives that we'll talk about. This includes independent contractors. So independent contractors, they usually have a more flexible environment. Oftentimes, they are self-employed individuals and they're working kind of on an as needed basis. Interns and externs. So we don't really think about them as often when we're talking about non-competes, but you know this is part of the reason why the FTC saw the need to issue this rule because of the broad use of, of non-competes within the industry. So say for example, you have someone who is in a temporary position who is essentially a student at a school and is working for you as a part of their course studies. Now this will apply to them. Same with volunteers. So if you have somebody who comes and works for you, even if it's without compensation, say they are getting community service hours for their school, working at a veterinary clinic, you know, doing different things to, to help the public, not necessarily nonprofit work, but things where they're not otherwise being paid. Doesn't matter what the title, whether they're paid or unpaid, high level, low level contractors, employees, or, or what have you, any of these are going to be considered workers under the rule. And all workers who provide some sort of service, some sort of work, to the business or to the other party are going to be covered and the rule is going to apply to them unless they fall under one of the narrow exceptions. So let's talk about senior executives because this is probably the closest thing to what you were thinking of for those high level employees, except they stopped short of September 4. Right. So what I mean by that is that they created an exception for senior executives who can continue to have non-competes, the caveat being those non-competes have to be in force as of the effective date, as of September 4. So if you've got a senior executive who falls under one of these or under these uh, provisions, now is the time to make sure you get a non-compete signed with them before that can no longer be done. So a senior executive is someone that we're talking about who's in a policymaking position and makes more than 151000 annually. There's a few different ways that can be calculated, uh, but generally, that's what we're looking at. Now, policymaking position, what does that mean? It's a pretty vague, broad term, and the FTC did a little bit of a roundabout in defining it, but generally, we're talking about people who have the authority to make policy decisions, to control significant aspects of the business entity itself, not just advising the company or exerting influence over that decisions. You know, we're not talking about people on a board of advisors. We're talking about the person who can say, on behalf of the company, I'm making this decision. So we've got senior executives will be everything from your C-suite level executives, your CEO, CFO, CLO, to your corporate officers, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, 
And in the case of an LLC, it could even be the manager. Now, for the officers, for the manager, a lot of that's with the caveat of what level of power those individuals actually have. Because a company can vest these parties with a lot of power to be able to actually manage the business and make decisions on its behalf, or it can really be more of a hollow title. So ideally, what we're looking at is those people who will have some sort of authority to make a decision on behalf of the company uh, without needing to go to someone else for approval. So that's all going to be, again, only these non-competes that are in effect prior to September 4th. So if you wait until September 4th and you sign a new non-compete with this party, it's not going to be enforceable. But if you sign it on the 3rd, it'll be enforceable for the term of whenever that non-compete would end. So Ben and I just had a meeting with a gentleman who is an executive. He is running a location for a company. The, the company has many locations and this particular location, he's running it and he has a non-competition non agreement or non-competition clause in his employment agreement that was entered into in the past, right? So before now, and the and he's making more than $151,164 a year. And so then the question is, is he in a policy making position? And he's like, well, I run this location. I make everyone's schedule. I tell people how to do their jobs. But then the bigger question is, or is he just enforcing the policies that were passed down to him from corporate that they're like, hey, this is how we want you to do things. Now, obviously you have the freedom to do things within that scope, but this is, and so obviously it's vague. This is where lawyers are gonna, are gonna fight. This is where the sandbox that we play in. And this is where the litigation is gonna, is gonna arise. Right. Is he so think about it. He quits and he wants to go because that's his profession. It's like his livelihood. That's the one thing he knows how to do. So he quits that job. And let's say he opens up his own shop and it's in relatively the same area because, you know, at a certain point, the, the geographic scope is wide enough that where would he, he would have to move in order to no longer be within the geographic scope. So without moving, he quits his job. He opens his own place and then they sue him for violating the beat. And his defense is. I wasn't a C-level executive and their argument is, yes, you were, you were running the location and you made policy there. And that's where the lawyers are going to fight. And you see, I think the FTC thought about this because, you know, when I talk about say managers here, you know, a lot of people get that term confused because within an LLC, you're going to be able to have either a member managed LLC or a manager managed LLC. And the manager managed LLCs, that's where we've got that individual who's been appointed typically to run day-to-day -day operations and make most decisions on behalf of the company short of certain major thresholds that you might define. Manager's not going to include, and this is something a lot of people are going to ask, it's not going to include, say, the manager of a store. We're not talking about the manager of the Bath and Body Works down in Brickle. We're talking about the guy's who are managing the company itself. So when the FTC put out the rule, they included language to confirm that, say, being able to direct a subsidiary would not make you a senior executive in and of itself. So for example, I would probably treat a location similar to that, where if I have the authority to direct and control this one location, I'm probably not going to be considered a senior executive. Rather, it, I would have to be able to direct and control, let's say, corporate that oversees all of these things. So let's go on to our first real caveat. Now, bona fide sales of a business. So when are we still going to see these non-competes? This is a big one. We talked a little bit about it earlier in context of mergers and acquisitions. The rule does not apply when the non-compete clause is incorporated into an agreement where that term is tied to your legitimate sale of interest in a company. So for example, 
That'll mean in a stock or a membership interest sale, or even in an asset sale where we're just selling substantially all the assets of the company, we can still be bound by non-competes. People don't often think of owners as employees, but the owners are the people we're most concerned about, especially when you're acquiring a company, not to go out and just create the same company and reproduce to become your next big competitor. So say in an acquisition, the buyer, that buying business can require those owners enter into a non-compete to protect the value of what they're buying. And again, we'll go back to what are those three key elements. They'll want to be able to define what is the term? How long is that non-compete necessary for us to protect this business? What is the geographic scope? Where are we buying this business? Where is it going to operate? Where are we going to expand into reasonably? And then, of course, what does the business actually do? What is it that we don't want these guys to open a business to provide those services to? But on the flip side, this also means that we can now look at partnership agreements. So business partners can continue to incorporate these non-competes into those agreements, their operating agreement, their shareholders agreement, uh, where we've got restrictions that might be both during the term of your membership, your ownership of the company, but also for a period of time after you exit the company. Because unless it is going to be some sort of um, ominous means for how you lost your interest in the business, and here's where the litigators will jump in, uh, that transfer of your shares when you leave the company is likely to be considered a bona fide sale. Even if you're not selling all of your interest and you're just retaining a little bit, in that case, you might still be bound by non-competes during the term of your ownership. So we can make sure our partners between ourselves are still not going to become our competitor. And I think if you go back to the rationale that the FTC was using, they're, they're trying to protect, obviously, free competition and m bigger picture. They want to protect workers' rights to make a living and, and to continue to support their families. And they're not looking to protect business owners looking to cash out and sell their businesses. It's not like a group uh, that the FTC was looking to insulate. No, I mean, can you imagine having a sale of a business, especially where it's one that is based so heavily on relationships with the customers where you can't have a non-compete you're going to essentially gut the value of any business that people might buy just out of the sheer fear and possibility that they could turn around and open a competing business the next day so then we've got our next exception business to business we talked about it a little bit earlier the rules are only going to apply to natural persons. So business to business agreements are not going to be affected unless those agreements further put some sort of non-competition restriction on an individual worker of the entity. So for example, if you have a party signing on behalf of the company and themselves, and the non-compete would apply to both, that non-compete would likely be found invalid as it applied to the individual, but not to the business. Now let's take independent contractors as a great example. Now, a lot of independent contractors are just sole proprietors. They're operating themselves personally, individually. They don't have a legal entity or corporate structure, but as their business grows, they start talking to their attorneys, they start talking to their CPAs, and they realize that for liability purposes, heck, for reducing their tax liabilities, they can potentially be better off doing that through oftentimes an LLC, either as an S-Corp or just leaving it as a pass-through. And now once you're doing that, all of your contracts with your customers are likely between your business entity and them. And so in that case, these non-competes would not be enforceable business to business. So if you're going to go and you're going to hire a, uh, or 
it, it, they'll still be enforceable. So if you're going to go and you're going to hire an independent contractor and you want to ensure that they can't compete against you, well, you can contract with their business and the business won't be able to compete, but you've got to know in the back of your mind, this person could always leave and operate independently again. So same with joint ventures and other relationships between businesses. They can continue to utilize those non-competes, but that's never going to stop the human individual that's behind it. Even if we really try, you know, there's going to be a number of different provisions that we can use to try to limit those, those risks and those issues. But, you know, say if you're hiring independent contractors who are individuals, they're just not going to be bound. And if it's a company that you're hiring, hopefully it's one that is big enough that they wouldn't want to walk away from it in order to go and compete. And I, I would just add that a lot of companies that operate on a business model where they most of the people who work for them are independent contractors, um, a lot of um, private, uh, I've seen this in uh, tutors, right? So you'll hire a tutor, but you're not going to hire the tutor for your kids as a W-2 employee. You're going to hire the tutor for your kid as a 1099 independent contractor. And I'll take it a step further. A lot of these companies force them to open up an LLC. It'll actually say, we will only pay a company. We will not pay you directly. And so in that circumstance, presumably there's going to be a written agreement. And then that written agreement can have the non-compete language. All right. So we got a we couple could, more. We could talk about all of the loopholes and that's where lawyers get creative. And obviously it's going to end up just being a corporate shell game. The guy will just close one LLC and open another, but that's a different conversation. Exactly. And, you know, there's a couple more exceptions and primarily that's going to be industry specific. So the FTC does not have authority over nonprofits. And in the rule, they made that very explicitly clear. So if you are an employee or you're contracting with nonprofit entities, they're not going to be subject to this rule. They very well may still be able to enforce that against you. Same with certain other industries. So banks, savings and loan institutions, federal credit unions, common carriers, air carriers and foreign air carriers, um, and then parties that are subject to the Packers and Stockyards Act. So you know, meat packing, livestock dealers, and so on. That's not to say that there aren't going to be restrictions coming in the future, but for now, at least as far as the FTC is concerned, they don't have authority over those industries. And so those guys are not going to be subject to the rule at this time. Interesting. So let's talk about prior breaches. There's two different situations that this is going to come up. The new rule is not going to apply to causes of action that accrued before the effective date, before September 4th. So what that means is that if you have someone who's subject to a non-compete right now, and between now and September 4th, they breach that non-compete, you can still pursue them for damages and any other relief that might be available under the contract. So for example, uh, when you're talking about injunctive relief, that's often something that people are really focused on when they're enforcing a non-compete. You might be able to get injunctive relief, but it'll probably end up being limited to through September 4th. And that's something that we're seeing people be hesitant on already now that this rule has come out, not knowing, well, how long can we actually enforce this for? Your damages, obviously, all of that is going to continue to accrue and happen through that period. But once September 4th hits and the future competition would no longer be uh, enforceable under the agreement and the rule, now we have to kind of switch gears. So because the uh, rule is only going to apply to post-employment non-competition, we also have the flip side of breaches that occur before termination of their employment. So oftentimes this is where one of the biggest points of contention will be in non-compete disputes is 
an employee who takes information, who starts their competing business, who starts bringing on people and taking those significant steps towards competing with you during their employment, that could, depending on how far they've gone, still be something that you could pursue as a violation of non-compete. So that's good news for the litigators. There's still going to be cases <laughs> for at least a while. Exactly. We've got to keep somebody in business. Now, there's a couple of big legal challenges, and we'll just talk about them briefly. So Ryan LLC versus the FTC, this is the main one that's going on. The parties are essentially trying to argue that this rule should not go into effect and that the courts need to issue a stay to prevent the rule from taking effect on September 4th until all of the issues can be addressed. Their big concern is that they believe the FTC doesn't have uh, statutory authority to issue the rule. So, you know, their, their main points are that they don't have the authority to prohibit methods of unfair competition through rulemaking, that the language they're using to classify essentially all non-competes as unfair competition is far too broad and, and is contradictory to Section 5 of the FTC Act. Essentially, that they haven't showed that the benefits of all of these are outweighed by the harm, that there essentially is no non-compete that could potentially be more beneficial than the harm that it causes. They're also upset and challenging the fact that this essentially is retroactive, that it's wiping away non-competes that are already in existence. And then looking at other issues, say uh, that the litigants are going to have to rely on trade secrets or, or other costs that are going to be simply more difficult and, and more flawed. Then we have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and this was really the big player that we were looking for to challenge the, uh, the rule. However, they were beat out by Ryan by, I think, a matter of hours. And so what ultimately ended up happening is that the court decided we're not going to have two cases that are nearly identical going concurrent throughout this process. Ryan was first in time, so that's the one that we're going to uh, pursue. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce essentially became an intervener, joined into the Ryan LLC case in order to assert its position as well. So again, going into, they don't believe the FTC actually has the authority for rulemaking. They don't believe that their interpretation of unfair competition is in line with the act. And then otherwise that the rule and their delegation is unconstitutional. Be interesting to see what the courts decide. Absolutely. I mean, I think everyone is, especially, you know, business law and litigators, we're on pins and needles to see if the court actually takes action. Now, you know, in terms of what comes next, employers should be planning and bracing themselves for this rule taking effect on September 4th. There is always a chance that come September 4th, a stay will be issued, the rule won't go into effect, and there will be more time. But short of that, this is happening, and it's happening in a pretty short period. So we don't want anyone waiting till last minute, because if we have however many uh, millions of business owners wait until September 1st to decide what they're going to do, I guarantee none of their attorneys are going to have the capacity to, to get all those new agreements done. So the first things first for employers is notifying their employees. So the notice that employers have to give to their employees or to their workers is to essentially let them know that they're no longer going to be bound by the non-competes they may have already signed and that those non-competes won't be enforceable. That notice has to identify 
the party that this person entered the non-compete with. So the company that they are not supposed to compete against. And you've got to either deliver it to that worker by hand if you can, or to their last known physical address, email, or at the very least by text message over phone. Now, if you have absolutely no record of any of this contact information, somehow you hired someone, you had them sign a non-compete, and you don't know where they live, you don't have a phone number or an email, then you're going to be theoretically exempt. But let's be frank, somehow we communicated with this person. We've all got to have a record somewhere of those parties, especially if we're planning to enforce the non-compete against them one day otherwise, surely we had some way of how we were going to find this person. That's funny because, you know, I'm thinking about it myself uh, and, and just mechanically, I'm going to have to ask my HR manager to go through the contracts of every employee who work, who, who currently, I guess, currently and who previously worked for us in the time period where the non-compete could still be enforceable. And that on its own is going to be a project. And then we're going to have to try to contact all of those people to let them know that if they were subject to a non-compete that they no longer are. Uh, I just, I can see the administrative headache internally already. Exactly. And then, you know, imagine the FTC's thought, if you don't even have all these people lined up and you don't know who they are, why are you so concerned about enforcing a non-compete against them? Fair. So the FTC provided a template example notice that you can find on the FTC's website. I provided it here as well. Essentially, this walks through just the bare minimum of what that notice would need to include. And if you use this template, you're essentially, you know, able to uh, be safe from any sort of argument that you didn't provide proper notice. Um, so, you know, here we walk through, okay, we've identified that the FTC has made it unlawful to enforce this. We, the party who you had that agreement with, won't enforce it. And what that effectively means for these individuals, that they can seek other jobs, they can run their own business, and generally that they'd be able to compete with that employer again. So what is the next step for employers? And, and Eric, you really kind of hit the nail on the head. That is, we've got to go back and come September 4th, you know, once we've notified all these people, we've got to revamp everything that we've been doing. So all those non-competes that we had, where sure, we had the non-compete during employment, but then it extended post-employment, we've got to review our policies. We've got to update our contracts, remove those post-employment non-competes because now trying to have an employee or worker sign one of those non-competes would be a violation of the rule. We've got to make sure we're protecting our interests. So what other protections are available? Non-disclosure agreements, non-solicitations, other things that we can now incorporate into those contracts if they're not already there or beef up to ensure that really those interests we actually care about are being protected in the is going to understand it and it's going to be quick and easy. We've got to teach our people, you know, so that means going to your HR person, making sure they're up to speed, making sure they've read through any materials that that you guys have as to how we can comply with the new rule and what that means for the company going forward. Can I just say, I really like the little stock art with the guy with the plan on the, on the big white piece of paper. I think that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> See, we try to keep it entertaining. So we've talked about employers. What does this mean for employees? So first and foremost, any worker needs to become familiar with the rule understand what obligations they still have through the effective date and afterwards and how they need to conduct themselves in the meantime. You see a lot of people out there on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook saying, oh, the FTC declared the non-competes as unenforceable. Go out and start your business today. 
no, that is the wrong, that is the wrong idea. Like we talked about, breaches of your non-competes through September 4th are still going to be enforceable. And for some people, you might fall under one of those exceptions where your non-compete will, will not fall under the rule. But otherwise, you know, mobility. Skilled workers now might have the opportunity to change jobs without having to change industries, change geographic regions, or otherwise just fear litigation if they don't wait out that period. They've got, at the very least, almost a, a hard deadline of September 4th for when they can take that next step, if that's what they choose to do. And then, of course, starting new businesses. So you're going to see a lot of these people probably go out, take those skills, that know-how, and even, unfortunately, some of the relationships they have, and all the more reason to get your new contracts in place as quick as possible, to start their own businesses now that they won't have a non-compete in place. I can't tell you how many times I'm talking to an employee and they don't have a copy of their own contracts. And, and a lot of times we're at the end of the relationship or, or post-employment. And imagine the post-employment, they send an email to their old boss and say, hey, can you send me a copy of my contract I signed a couple of years ago? That The boss has no obligation to share that with you. It's not your property. In fact, it's their property. So tip to employees, when you get a job, if you sign a contract, ask for a copy right when you start and everyone's on happy, good footing. And then make sure you save it somewhere. Don't save it in your work email, which you're not going to have access to after you leave. So make sure you save it somewhere, be organized so that when you come talk to an employment lawyer and you say, and the person says, Hey, do you have a copy of your contract? You're like, yeah, absolutely. Here you go. And it's not a, some tricky issue. Now, Eric, why don't you run us through some of the big restrictive covenants that you often see and advise your clients to put into their agreements, not even thinking about your non-competes, but what are the big ones here? We've got a few up. So this is probably, currently, I think it's, it's one of the most important parts of the contract. And then going forward, it's all we're going to be able to rely on. So it will be the most important part of the contract. But the restrictive covenants are the clauses in the employment agreement or other type of agreement that restrict the person's ability to do certain things. And let's go through them real quick. So the first one is non-disclosure, the NDA, the non-disclosure agreement or clause. And this is going to say that the all the things you learn about our company on the inside, you got to keep secret. Now, the confidentiality is, is a synonym really with non-disclosure, but I've actually seen where you're agreeing that the agreement is confidential. The agreement that you signed is confidential, so you can't go around showing people, you can't post it on Twitter. Um, a third is non-interference. Now, this is, think about what this says. You can't come back and try to steal my other employees or try to interfere with my other relationships, whether those are relationships with vendors, relationships with with, and I, I always think of Jerry Maguire, right? So when maybe I'm dating myself, but Jerry Maguire, he's like, he gets fired. And then he, on his way out the door, he says, who's coming with me, right? And only one person uh, decides to go with him. Well, that would be a violation of the non-interference clause because he's convincing somebody else to quit. Um, Non-solicitation, for me, this is probably the most important. This is don't go after your clients, right? So you can leave, you can compete, you can go set up your own shop, you can go work for the competition, but you can't go down and just start calling everybody that you had as a client while you were working for me. And that will probably be the most litigated issue. Um, and I, always, I already see people playing games. They're like, well, what if they contact me and I don't contact them? And I've even had some ones where I was pretty much being solicited by somebody in violation of their non-solicitation agreement. And they're like, hey, make sure you, you use my personal email and not my work email which is all discoverable, by the way, in litigation, but but whatever, that's not my problem, it was his. Um, and then last but not least, non-disparagement. This was the don't go on social media and say bad things about, my, about the company after you leave. Um, and so these things are still gonna be allowed and are gonna become more important. Absolutely, and, and I think non-interference and non-solicitation have a interesting second little avenue there where we're not just talking about your clients, but we're also talking oftentimes about your employees. So the non-interference, don't come and mess with the relationships I have with your former coworkers. Non-solicitation, don't come and try to hire away all of these skilled workers 
who you know work for me now and who you had experience working with previously that you're going to try to take for your new business venture. Imagine how devastating it would be. You spend years building up your business and making this fantastic team of people only to have one of your employees leave, create a competing business, and now take your entire core team with them. There's a couple of additional types of agreements that we often want to see and, and might start seeing more of now. So your intellectual property agreements and your proprietary rights agreements, things that deal with who owns the intellectual property that was created during your employment or that was provided or made available during your employment, how can it be used? Proprietary information dealing with, say, your customer lists um, or other materials that may have been created, things that don't fall directly under one of the traditional forms of intellectual property, aside from, say, trade secret, but otherwise that we want to be able to maintain control over. And then we have another kind of provision that in Florida we don't really see very often, but in other states where non-competes haven't really been enforceable for a while or they're very difficult to enforce, you see much more. So that's these garden leave provisions. So what does that really mean? That means that you've got a provision in the agreement where it requires the worker to give some level of notice before they can terminate the agreement. Oftentimes, this is going to be more effective with, say, independent contractors, as typically in Florida and in many other states, we're a at-will state. And so you can terminate your employment at any time, whether you're right or wrong. Now, there can be consequences for doing it without uh, providing certain notice, but the garden leave provisions essentially allow you to lock someone in for a period of time after their notice where you're going to still be paying them, but they aren't going to be required to work and they might be prevented from even coming into work. You might say, okay, you're going to give me notice. You've got a one month period where I'll continue to pay you your salary but we're deactivating access to all of your emails, can't come into the office, you can't reach out to any of our clients, and you're still our employee. So for this one month period, you can't engage in any sort of non-competitive behavior. Because again, the rule applies only to post-employment non-competes. So if we can lock them in for a short period of time, we're willing to pay for that extra little bit. That might allow us to transition clients, transition files over to new workers, allow a new employee to have that touch point and build a relationship with this person. So they're a little bit harder to just walk away when their favorite service provider is no longer there. For my next job, I am going to negotiate a two month garden leave. And then when they fire me, I'm going to Europe. I'm just going to go hang out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be the life. Now, we don't really know a whole lot about how this rule is going to be enforced. The FTC is effectively going to operate as its own enforcement arm. So it's going to be the primary agency for receiving and investigating complaints or reports of noncompliance by uh, companies or businesses uh, of this rule. They're going to be the ones that will go out and theoretically have some sort of mechanism for having penalties or fines or or other actions to require employers to get in compliance. There's going to be private rights of action. So employees who are subject to a non-compete, who are forced to sign a new non-compete in violation of the rule, may have the ability to file suit against their employer. That might mean that they can do anything from nullify, nullify that non-compete clause to get damages. And we're talking about contracts, possibly even attorney's fees, if there's an attorney's fees clause. We always hate to, to leave that one out, but this is one of those times where that could rebound on you if you decide that you want to push these guys into a, a corner that 
they're willing to, to fight their way out of. And then last, we've got state level. Now, the FTC is going to be the big bad in terms of enforcement, but I would not be surprised if we start seeing the state attorney generals uh, have some authority to either enforce the violations of the FTC rule within their jurisdiction or otherwise be in direct collaboration with the FTC to investigate, report, and ferret out uh, large potential violations that uh, people might be complaining of or, or that they might think is, is harming their, their state. I, I think it's going to be interesting. I think business owners need to be on guard. They need to make sure that they are educated and aware. And so at EPGD, we're going to be doing our best to, to do just that, notify and educate our clients. And then if you are an employee, go look at your agreement, go see what it says, and then be able to or be willing to, to defend yourself if if an employer is wrongfully coming after you for enforcement of an unenforceable agreement. Absolutely. And that wraps up everything for us. It's a lot to take in and there is quite a bit that's going to be changing for many employers, many employees. And the most important thing that any of you guys can do is going to be to ask questions. You know, there are caveats to this rule. There are different issues that could come up where non-competes are still going to be enforceable, where you might think the non-compete is going to be enforceable and this person is going to be able to circumvent that for one reason or another. And for a while, we're going to expect that the litigation is going to be a lot of people on very different sides until the courts start issuing further guidance or rules that point us in a direction as to how, in practice, this is going to be interpreted. Because right now, it, it's a guessing game. The FTC gave us 500 some odd pages of guidance, but until it actually happens and we see it in practice, there is a, a lot of room for, for change. Well, Ben, uh, great work, great presentation. And uh, I'm happy to report that the QR codes both are functional and take you to our bios on our website. Um, we have recorded this, we'll be sharing the recording. And if anyone wants a copy of the presentation, we're happy to share that as well. And we will rerun this at a later date and we'll be promoting it online. So obviously our marketing team will take care of that um, and great work. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.